Hello everyone and welcome to a video on the Mars capabilities of Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket and featuring some of the plans of NASA to get humans to Mars. Uh, this particular launch involves the habitat unit of NASA's plans and well they're a little bit vague on exactly what size is except that it's going to be using 8.4 meter uh, tooling because they want to use the same tooling for the habitat as they've been using for SLS itself. So what I've done here is basically take the hydrogen tank from the upper stage of SLS and turned it into a habitat. Uh, I went into configurations and added a new part called SLS based crew hab and uh, added a token amount of food, water, and oxygen and waste area and electric charge and gave it a controller that consumes a little bit of electric charge. Also I used lackluster labs to add little portholes. Uh, they actually do have mass by the way uh, so it adds mass when adding those. They're not a whole lot. And otherwise uh, this is on on a regular two-stage New Glenn rocket with the recoverable first stage and we are going to reserve fuel for that. And Normally this whole module, which is also called the Deep Space Transport or also Mars Transit Vehicle, would be launched on an SLS. Uh, but I've broken it up into three parts so that it could be launched on New Glenn instead. So this is the first of three parts and we're going to try and dock them together and see how they work. The total mass of the habitat portion is roughly 41 tons. Uh, the, the tank itself here, this tank is a little bit over 20 tons, but then there's also other structural bits like this EUS intertank which I'm using, and also the docking port structure up front. Also I added a cupola, uh, because I figured they'd probably want a cupola, uh, so that added more mass to it. And yeah, my, my basic mission plan, unlike NASA's, is to have four people being sent to Mars, not six. And so... Uh, that's what this can accommodate and uh, we have uh, empty supplies here you can sort of see here oxygen fo food and water we only have 10 percent of our total supply capacity and that's because I expect another supply vessel to rendezvous with this in order to resupply it with the necessary supplies before we go ahead otherwise it would be over the capacity of the New Glenn rocket and besides you don't want to leave the supplies in there uh, for very long and it might take a while to get the crew to this particular vehicle so best to send the supplies with the crew instead of having it uh, potentially um, just sit there especially the food I'm not entirely sure if it's a good idea to have it sitting there though of course they're going to have to have pretty good refrigerators and freezers to uh, keep the food good for a long trip yeah, uh, by the end of the trip, I imagine that the food is not going to be the most appetizing stuff in the world. But who knows? Uh, that's, a, that's a big part of planning that's underappreciated as far as Mars plans. Um, how's the food going to be? <laughs> so, you know, you're not growing anything, you're not getting anything fresh. Um, you could grow stuff, but that takes a lot more effort. Uh, so... Yep, the food's going to be interesting. Okay, we've got the food, uh, fuel reserved on the first stage. And the second stage, the two BE-3 engines are lit. And we are proceeding. In a moment, the uh, fairing will separate and we'll get a look at the front end. Of course, I had to do a custom fairing arrangement because we didn't want the huge SLS fairings on here. So we have these small fairings and you can see the cupola there and a docking port. Uh, the docking port is sort of a question mark thing because the cupola actually has a hatch on the top part and but basically I'm assuming that we're okay with just having side windows. So if it's not obvious, and it's probably not obvious, uh, the goal of this is to provide space for for the astronauts on their trip to the moon and on the way back and what they're going to do is they're going to dock Orion to this and on the way there they're going to um, have this extra space here and on the way back uh, they'll eventually undock Orion and use it to re-enter Earth's atmosphere and come back down back home. 
The whole assembly has got to be propelled by a combination of um, storable fuels, hypergolic fuels, as well as the solar electric propulsion system. So it seems like NASA is pretty set on having a solar electric propulsion system for the deep space transport and Mars transit vehicle. And we'll see the implementation of that here in a subsequent launch. The third launch will have that system. And the benefit, of course, is high ISPs. The downside is really, really, really bad thrust. So that's why you have to have the hypergolic system in tandem, because otherwise you don't produce enough thrust to do quick maneuvers. But certainly the solar electric propulsion system will help a lot. And that is why this is not crewed right now, and Orion will be used to send crew up to it. Uh, if you had to use the solar electric propulsion system to boost to a high Earth orbit with crew on board, it'd take forever. And of course, they'd be passing through the radiation belts too often. So what it's going to do is we're going to dock the solar electric propulsion system to this and without crew boost it up to a high orbit. And it's supposed to be the Earth-Moon second Lagrange point, L2. And that's where they're going to park it so that Orion can rendezvous with it. And of course, uh, we've sort of demonstrated that depending on where you want to park this, I don't know if uh, L2 is reachable with New Glenn and Orion, but you could find another vehicle that could get to it with, I mean, not another vehicle, uh, another point to park it where Orion could, could definitely uh, dock with it safely, and a uh, high lunar orbit would be one of those places. We know that Orion can get to a high lunar orbit without any problems. Maybe L2 is possible with New Glenn as well. My goal here is obviously to sort of uh, have an alternative to SLS while still retaining the systems that are already being built by NASA and are thoroughly researched and, you know, uh, well thought out, really. I mean, of course, the deep space transport part is reasonably well thought out. Uh, the, I'm not a big fan of the deep space gateway thing, which is the, the station around the moon. That I'm not particularly fond of, though again we've seen that it's possible to launch that on this as uh, this rocket, the New Glenn, as well. New Glenn does have better capabilities to the moon than Falcon Heavy, so and that's because of the cryogenic upper stage, so even though Falcon Heavy has a higher payload to low Earth orbit, uh, because it doesn't have a cryogenic upper stage, it uh, can't get as much payload over to the moon. So that's one reason for the preference. The other reason for the preference is simply the payload size for New Glenn rocket is better because of its 7 meter diameter. Uh, an 8.4 meter uh, module like this would not look particularly good on Falcon Heavy. As far as BFR is concerned, there's just too many question marks. Um, uh, within a year we went from ITS to BFR and the whole system changed its look and to a large extent um, BFR is sort of uh, not BFR, well BFR yeah the BFR ship is its own little system and it's basically a system that negates all other designs right I mean uh, it yeah it's, it's not entirely clear that it's ever really meant to deploy other modules it's never really meant to uh, send the Orion capsule anywhere, or it's meant to do everything on its own, right? Land on the moon on its own, and uh, it could be a little station around the moon all on its own. Um, it's not entirely clear it's how it's meant to be used with other systems. I do, uh, uh, there is a payload variant, but I'm not really clear about the parameters of that. And yeah, so uh, there's a few question marks on that system. The New Glenn rocket is relatively easy to understand, so I'm a little bit more comfortable making predictions and putting pay payloads on top of it. It also presents very nice constraints. Okay, there we go. 
in that, you know, it has a very definite limit of 45 tons to low Earth orbit, and that means you have to design your stuff with some, you know, efficiency. I don't feel like BFR is requiring much efficiency from payload designers. So here we are, these are actually two AJ-10190s, in other words, two of the service module propulsion engines from the Orion system. And of course, these are also the OMS engines for the shuttle. And they are providing the same purpose, the same functionality that they would have on the shuttle right now. But you can see the system as it is. Uh, these are, of course, the fuel tanks. We've uh, gone with MMH and MON3 because that's what the Orion capsule uses. All right, and it is shut down. So uh, this here is the supply tank, the food, water, and oxygen directly adjacent to the habitat module. So obviously, otherwise they wouldn't be able to reach it. And we've got nice solar panels, so let's extend them and make sure they work properly. These are from near future. And indeed, the electric charge is recharging. There's no reaction wheel on here right now. It's just RCS thrusters. Oh wait, there is a reaction wheel. I'll take it back. <laughs> I guess I, I reconsidered that. Yes, there is a reaction wheel. So that's good. Probably a good idea. All right, so we have center in 41 meters per second. I don't know whether this is going to do most of the docking or whether the other two modules will, but the next module is the solar module. So let's get it to here. Okay, so here is our second launch, and this is basically the solar arrays for the ion engines, and they have to be pretty darn big. I've uh, realistically sized them, made sure that it... Uh, it comports with what the plans seem to be, though uh, I'm using fewer engines and my my solar electric propulsion unit is smaller than what uh, NASA seems to be planning. Uh, I'm using four engines of 125 kilowatt size, whereas they want to use eight, it looks like. At least some of the papers suggest that. So uh, we will see how that goes and I'll discuss the trade-offs on that. So here we go though, we have to rendezvous it with the other part and so of course this does have some hypergolic thrusters as well um, they do want to put uh, some of the ion engines on gimbals to help turn the rocket but I, I'm not entirely sure uh, of course that's very efficient and all but I think I don't have the patience for it <laughs> basically uh, this seems to be tilted a little bit it bears mentioning that I haven't actually launched this stuff yet. Of course I've tested New Glenn Rocket and its capacity, you saw the videos there. Um, but I'm thinking right now that maybe my solar arrays... Ooh, that's not... hold on. That's not right at all. I think there's been some node issue here. Well, shoot. Uh, abort. Let me bring this back in and see what's going on there. Okay, so one thing that's been happening is that when I put these girder segments from near future construction, I think, on the procedural tank here, uh, they get displaced for some reason. And that's been a persistent problem, so uh, it's whenever you open the file. Anyway, uh, this is our solar, uh, well, most of our solar array module. And uh, you can see I've used the solar panels from the ISS. So they are ISS solar array wings. I trust they are things that we have available to us, so that is reasonable. And I've made sure to put enough of them in order to power the ion engines that I've got. Though uh, at Mars, they won't be running at full power. In fact, I don't think they would be running at full power anyway. They do have their own, they can take their own sweet time getting out to the Lagrange point or wherever they need to go in preparation for the Orion rendezvous so don't need to be at full thrust or anything I think ion engines are more efficient if they're not at full thrust but anyway let's uh, try and launch this now I guess the 
more accurate way, way of putting it is that for a given amount of power, uh, if you are trying to accelerate you know, these little particles in the ion engine, if you have lower thrust, you get higher ISP because you can accelerate them faster with the given amount of thrust, uh, with the, the given amount of power. But if you increase the thrust, you lower the amount, you can shoot them out the back at the velocity, the exhaust velocity. And so you get lower ISP for higher thrust. And so there's a trade off. And that's why uh, we have low thrust ion engines. Well, one reason. Anyway, uh, let's target our other module. I guess, well, I don't know if uh, we want to launch with this inclination. It could be irritating. Could be alright. Let's go with it. I think we have enough delta V in the in the HAB module to take care of it. I believe actually we'll be able to hang on to the second stage and use it to perhaps correct this inclination before letting go of the module. That'll help. The ISS solar arrays are not the best solar arrays we could have used. They're older technology now and uh, we could do better. So it's just because I had the model available that I decided to go with them. But uh, technology has advanced and so the efficiency could be better and maybe I can do an additional configuration on this particular module to reflect the better efficiency that we could expect from solar arrays now. I mean you can see how much extra delta V we're leaving behind here so that's why I'm saying that maybe I could figure out some way of using that. This could be boosted all the way to the moon. But we have no way of getting the HAB to the moon without the ion engine module, and the ion en engine module can't work without the solar panels, so we have that problem. So anyway, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll add an extra xenon fuel tank here. That's a, that's another problem with the ion thing, though. Uh, there isn't that much xenon propellant production in the world, actually. Uh, basically, we make about 50 to 60 tons a year metric tons and that's not a whole lot uh, that's enough for one mission kind of thing so and of course they can't buy it all at once otherwise they'll skew the prices and it, uh, I read a whole paper on that too so yeah hmm we've got some problems in that area okay I would like to line up the solar arrays and also make sure that our engines are at a 90 degree angle to them now obviously this is not the best position for these AJ 10190s it'd be better to have them on the back where the ion engines are gonna be um, I'll have to think about adding additional ones to the back but right now we don't have those Oh, we've got a bump and we've got a connection okay so no rotational issue RCS off um, I've placed these so that these can stay extended just in case they can't actually retract and retract in real life so let's just get everything set up here it's a close call though so actually you know what maybe I didn't do that quite right let's retract them just for safety's sake while those are doing their thing. Yeah, it looks like I didn't quite give it enough clearance. Okay, so there we have our the beginnings of our ship. And now we have to put the ion engine module on. And so once again, to the launch pad. Okay, so here we are with the solar electric propulsion module, and let's see if we can get up there without any fuss. Run New Glenn. 
Now, unlike NASA's version, uh, mine's again only has half the engine power, which also means less mass, which is good, and also less propellant necessary. So I'm not carrying like 50 tons of propellant, obviously this could not lift that. We'll see exactly how much propellant and delta V we've got. Interestingly, in order to get a solar electric propulsion system like this out to the Lagrange point, um, you need like 6,000 meters per second, 6,300 something. And that's because it's going out in a spiral. It's not like transferring out uh, like a normal mission out to the moon would and then circularizing at apoapsis, basically capturing around the moon. Um, instead, it's constantly circularizing, and that's, in delta V terms, that's not very efficient, but of course, when you've got uh, more than 2,000 seconds of ISP, uh, it ends up being okay, right? Uh, you'll still be using less fuel. Xenon gas is, um, again, we don't produce that much of it right now. Basically, they have to refine it through the atmosphere. The atmosphere has a little bit of it, uh, but yeah, it takes some doing to refine it, but actually it doesn't cost that much. I think it's something like $20 a liter. So, but we've got a lot of liters, so it would still pre be pretty expensive. But then again, uh, considering the expense of the Mars mission in total, it'd still be fairly cheap. Uh, assuming that it really would be 5 million liters here, uh, we're talking about $100 million, which is, okay, that is pretty expensive. It depends on how the price fluctuates. Uh, it goes between $5 and $30. It, it's pretty wild because there just isn't that much of it. So, yeah, $100 million is what you're looking at. But then again, you know, you can save on a much more expensive rocket being necessary. You know, and it, it would take an entire sequence of launches to get enough propellant to to fuel a Mars mission, but, you know, and then there's the BFR option, which is, again, its own sort of thing, right? The BFR option is its own sort of thing off to the side, they're doing its thing, and we'll just have to see how that works out, but it's, uh, yeah, of course it would take multiple launches in order to refuel it, but uh, the claim is that that would be cheaper than this way, and that economics has to be worked out in practical terms. After all, uh, it is sort of a space shuttle thing, right? Uh, the BFR ship is a pseudo space shuttle, again, crew uh, plus cargo, and uh, coming in through the atmosphere with a heat shield at the bottom, mini wings, and uh, of course landing on its tail instead of on wheels, but uh, it's basically a space shuttle. And we remember the claims of the space shuttle that, you know, it would cut down on launch costs dramatically and all of those claims about reusability and it turned out not quite as reusable I mean it took some effort uh, ignoring the solid rocket motors and the external fuel tank the shuttle itself which was the main expense anyway it's a multi-billion dollar space vehicle uh, they did I mean they did reuse much of it on each flight most of it uh, they had to replace some tiles they had to check out the engines. Checking out the engine costs about uh, 20 million for all three engines each time. 20, 25 million. So, it, it, I mean, uh, it's been overblown about how much it actually costs. Actually, uh, renovating the shuttle, as long as was. Uh, okay, there were certain times when it had to be brought into Rockwell for a uh, full overhaul kind of thing. But uh, otherwise, uh, flight to flight, it wasn't too bad main expense was the external tank and the boosters. So it was sort of reusable, but not as reusable as they would have liked, and of course flight frequency couldn't be kept up. And so we'll see how BFR does, uh, whether they've got it all figured out or whether they haven't. It's not the same as trying to refurbish uh, Falcon 9 first stage. The Falcon 9 first stage is way simpler than a spaceship meant to carry people in. And of course the engines on BFR, both the first stage and the upper stage, are more complicated than the Merlin engines. So we'll have to see how that works out.
but yeah we'll see I mean and you know the refurbishment time or whatever you want to call it for a Falcon 9 first stage is still about the same as the refurbishment time for a shuttle uh, the best the shuttle ever did was about 54 days and that was Atlantis between two of the missions before Challenger happened after Challenger happened they took more time on it but before Challenger happened they were trying to make it quicker and quicker uh, to refurbish the shuttle and to be fair the shuttle wasn't the part that had the problem on Challenger right it was the SRBs uh, so they didn't make a mistake refurbishing the shuttle and and yet it sort of suffered because of the expendable part of the whole deal but and also uh, ironically with Falcon 9 it's it's only incidents have been due to the upper stage right uh, the the helium tanks in particular but uh, it is the expendable upper stage that has been causing the problems for Falcon 9 and hopefully those are all fixed but it wasn't the first stage that caused the problem it wasn't the reusable part of it so ironic parallel there too uh, but yeah so we don't know exactly the capacity of SpaceX to really turn around something big quickly and of course that is what cost is all about. Uh, cost is hiring people and so what SpaceX is saying is that they don't need to hire as many people to turn around a BFR as they do to turn around a Falcon 9 first stage. That's quite a claim. And uh, But that's the claim that BFR being cheaper than this system hinges on, right? Uh, so we're doing three launches to launch this into orbit. BFR if it's a cargo version, could launch this into orbit on one launch, obviously. Um, well, okay, I don't know if it has the cargo bay length to actually launch in one launch, but you could launch them, sort of stack them in there somehow to manage it, but the cargo capacity-wise, it can launch it in one launch. But will it be cheaper? Is, uh, I don't know. Hmm. It appears that I've misjudged how much I could put on here, because it's having trouble getting to orbit right now. Fortunately, uh, no, no fortunately, it's all bad. <laughs> I might have to cut this down a bit. Interesting sound. These are actually lackluster labs parts, but I've modified them to uh, suit the purpose. Uh, except... Obviously not enough, considering they're not drawing the electric charge properly. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so something wrong going on there. Don't ask about the flame effect. Um, but 2,800 seconds ISP, uh, 0.1 kilonewtons is actually more than I thought they would have. I thought it was like 5 newtons, to be honest. Maybe it's rounding somehow. I'll look into that. Anyway, let's uh, fix this. And we'll have to deal with a little bit less fuel than I was intending to carry. And we'll see how that goes. So my takeaway from this is that we definitely need to put more xenon fuel in the second launch. The one with the solar arrays. and that Because that one is way under mass. And then we can take it out of this one so I can rebalance it that way and make sure we have enough of that fuel but let's see even though we underfueled the xenon here and actually let me unlock that and we might as well unlock the hypergolics right now as well yeah um, then we can get everything right but uh, let's see how much delta V this actually adds when it's underfueled All right, we have first stage set, second stage ignition. Okay, we're making orbit and shutdown. Turns out we could have packed a little bit more xenon in, but uh, of course we can only fill it up in 10% increments, so that was not an option. But okay, we can uh, have this 238 meters per second tag along to help us out perhaps. Let's see what we can do. We'll have to take our time rendezvousing, though. Oh, I forgot to extend the radiators on the other part of the mission. So one thing I have to do is review how these uh, ion engines are configured. I thought I was doing it right, but apparently not. And 
I also needed to work with persistent thrust. Mars Hab food is running out. Okay, well, there's nobody there, but it'll say that because uh, we only fill it up with 10% of the food, so. I wonder why, why is there four crew there? I didn't send four crew. It says four crew. Uh-oh. I think I should have looked inside. There's crew inside the hab already. I accidentally launched crew. Well, you see, because I just modified an SLS tank, uh, it doesn't have an IVA in it. So I accidentally put crew in, didn't I? That's why it's panicking. Uh, fortunately, of course, even with 10%, they've got a substantial amount of time. We could easily resupply, but we weren't really supposed to put Kerbals in just yet. That was not according to plan. Okay, approaching the target now. Uh, negative relative velocity would be good. We're still 43 tons here. So it's not a horrible counterweight to the HAB module, really. Uh, it shouldn't be depleted. Why is it depleted? It hasn't taken that long to get there. We've got problems. That Transmars HAB shouldn't have depleted food, water, and oxygen. We only took two days to get here, and last time I checked... Yeah, way more than that. There's something wrong going on. Well, I, that's why we're testing. Something wrong with how it's set up. It's got... No, not Jeb. We'll revert. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll find some way of reviving Jeb. Ship manifest. But this is un... Okay, let's, let's just go over there for a sec. What is up with you guys dying and everything? We've got a water purifier. Look at... Oh, wait. Did we lock? We locked the food, water, and oxygen. <laughs> well, that's why Jeb died. We locked the food, water, and oxygen. Of course he couldn't survive. See? Don't lock the food, water, and oxygen. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that explains it. Yeah, all right. Hmm. Oops. Uh, we have a water purifier and carbon extractor built in, by the way. And those are based on the ISS numbers. That's another fringe benefit to that hab. But obviously I've made some mistakes. Mistakes have been made. Okay, looking good. We probably need to slow down now. Actually, the RCS on this portion seems very good, so we don't have to worry too much. Okay, let's switch that off so we don't deviate. And we've got connection, and it's good. Alright, well, we need to switch some things off here. Having these little 1 kN thrusters blowing at each other probably... Wait, uh, those one kilonewton thrusters blowing at the other portion is probably not the best idea. Alright, look at that. Um, I'm gonna rotate it so that we can see where the panels sit properly side by side. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter whether we go nose up or nose down. Okay, yeah, a bit tight, but they are fine. They're not too close together. That's good. They're looking okay. And, uh, yeah, so I need to fix up the ion engines, and there are obviously other things I need to fix, put more xenon fuel here. If we take a look at what we've got in terms of delta-v on this, though, control from this, we've got 8,993 meters per second with the ion engines, and then a little bit more with the hypergolics. Uh, we could do with more hypergolic fuel, though, because that's important for capturing around Mars. Uh, using the ion engine to capture is not the, necessarily good, because we need to have that done quickly, though the ion engines can help slowing us down and matching Mars orbit beforehand, so they can help like that. 
But yeah, this is how the system looks right now. And so presumably uh, Orion spacecraft would dock here. As far as the lander is concerned, that's a bit of a different sort of thing. Uh, I would want to send that... Oh, the solar panels aren't quite in line with each other, don't it? I would want to send that over separately. So this should have all the supplies for a round trip as it does. Uh, well, as it has room for, we would have to send more supplies, obviously. Poor Jeb died. Anyway, we'll deal with that at some other time. Uh, but uh, we would send the lander separately, and the lander would have to rendezvous uh, with them in order for them to transfer over. We need some extra docking ports. This would basically become a station around Mars temporarily until it, uh, the time comes for a trip back. I think I should probably put docking ports on either side of this, too. Yeah, I'll think about this, but three launches of New Glenn gets this up here. It's a spacecraft at 99 tons with a substantial Delta V. As it is, of course, it'll have less Delta V with an Orion capsule on it. But still, it would be enough to transfer out to Mars, uh, help with the capture, and uh, help with coming back, I believe. That needs to be tested, too. But it, again, it depends on the mass of what you're trying to push along. Uh, NASA's plan seem to be to have much more being sent over to Mars than I'm planning on, because in part because they're planning on having six astronauts rather than four. So yeah, anyway, uh, this is progress as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.